Yeah. All right, cool. So, um, Ron Deck and Gigantor, I'm Alan. We introduced ourselves earlier. Um, so, let's see what we're covering. Um, <clears throat> so, a little bit of what I was going to cover is, uh, you know, Alex talked about a number of different plugin points. And so, I was going to cover a little bit of our solution and how we plug in to some of those various points and how we've used Run Deck. So, um, okay, it's all right. So I'm gonna introduce really what Gigantor is, talk about some of the components, Salt and Kingpin being notable ones. Um, we spent some investment in security, applying security from our existing infrastructure on top of Run Deck and how we did that. And then sort of go into, I mean, known unknowns, future directions, whatever you wanna call it. Some of which honestly you touched on, so I'm hopefully some of these you'll just tell us that they are now known knowns. Um, so Gigantor. So this is our internal project. As Phil had mentioned, we spent a while kind of researching various technologies before we uh, decided where we were. So this is really our orchestration solution. So we have a, a ton of in-house tooling that you know we've been running our business for a decade on it. It does a lot of things, and I think the points you touched on are very much why we selected Rundeck. Things like loosely coupled components, having a high-order language that can call out. You know, we can actually do the transition with existing tooling and sort of stabilize some of these workflows and make them repeatable, check them into source control, test them, and, and do a number of other things that are provided. Um, we have a lot of operators going to the data center to do things. And I think one of our larger visions that we're hoping to realize is everything goes through a software development life cycle, right? So it's, it's right now very easy for us to, you know, we have some good tooling where people do log in and, and execute things within, and we want to take that out. But we also want to make it so people don't have, they have an easy way to make changes in production globally, repeatably, you know, auditably, um, without, uh, without just logging in themselves and fixing it on the one box. Um, I mentioned that it sits atop other tooling. So that's, that's kind of the motivation of, of what, you know, of what we were trying to build. And please, this talk's going to be pretty quick, so feel free to jump in with questions. Um, so components. Run deck notably, I'm actually not going to talk too much about that because hopefully we all know what that is, but please ask questions as they come up. Uh, Kingpin, well actually let me talk about Salt first. So Salt Stack is our distributed execution engine. Um, as you mentioned, Run Deck has the default parallel SSH. It's got a plugin for Salt Stack. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the way we were looking at it is, you know, we have tens of thousands of nodes right now, and we are conceiving on how to get to hundreds of thousands of nodes, and how can you execute workflows across that reliably and get it distributed. Um, Salt's got a pretty good solution for that. Um, if you want to drill in, Phil can go into some of the history on, on how that particular decision was made. Um, but we've actually got all of this integrated right now. I don't have a demo for you, but I have a couple screenshots. So Kingpin is our front end. So again, going back to that little box Alex had with here are all the plugin areas, we also did the custom front end. Um, Let's see, what are some of the... So right now, this is our human interface. A lot of what we want Kingpin to be is we want to automate our data center more. And so we're definitely thinking ahead with like APIs and you know, right now we're gonna have, you know, right now it's all manual. User gets in the data center, executes a command line. And we're gonna pull that into a workflow where a user now logs on to a web UI and does it. Well, going forward, we want to integrate that with potentially monitoring. So we can actually short circuit the obvious paths of, you know, servers down, I want to restart it. I don't need a person, I just need an audit trail on that. So we're doing a lot of APIs around Kingpin. So Kingpin is definitely wrapped around the Run Deck APIs and it itself is going to expose APIs as well. Um, and then a lot of it, which the new Run Deck UI looks really nice for this, is we do want constrained execution. You know, we definitely want to make sure that not only do people log in and they're constrained to the authorizations that we want them to have, but it looks, it's presented in a language that makes sense to them, right? Because, you know, we have different people doing different things in the data center. Um, even, you know, we talked to, he showed all the groups of the different islands and the expertise that people have, they want to see things in their language. Um, so that's why we opted to do a custom front end for that. Uh, and then Run Deck, of course, like I said, sits in the middle. Uh, it's the workflow engine. It's the best one we'd found why we selected it. And it's the system of record. So, you know, these other things, Salt and Kingpin sit on front, but what's going on in Run Deck is, that's our system of record. That's where we want to see what happened. That's where we're going to do audits. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about some, some things that we, I think we're hoping to uh, 
figure out how to make that nice and reliable too. Um, so salt, I think it already came up that uh, someone on our team developed a source node step plugin. Um, it's the GitHub link is there. You can find it pretty easily if you search for uh, Rundex salt on GitHub. Um, so when you put this guy in, you got the little circle, uh, you get a couple of options, you fill those out, and this will actually execute all out through Salt API, and then you're into the Salt ecosystem. So whether we have some ideas about you know, Salt and Syndic and distribution going forward, but at the simplest level, this bridges the two. Um, and some of, some of the interesting things about this is the plugin actually, when you call out to Salt, uh, the plugin actually can monitor can sit there monitoring salt. It knows how to pull for what nodes were distributed to. And there's plenty of documentation as well on the plugin. So Kingpin, a couple of things about Kingpin. Um, we talked about how do you know what nodes to target and how does that work? So with Kingpin, we've built uh, a front end. So the thing on the right is uh, Kingpin, the thing on the left is Run Deck. Um, so when you do node targeting, you actually do that within Kingpin. So I don't know, is this a good, um, Oh, wow, sorry, you really can't read that. Um, so we have additional <coughs> concepts besides just nodes. For instance, like uh, the top thing there is data center. Um, and so the way we select nodes, because there's a large number of them, a list isn't really gonna work, so we have them broken down into Salesforce relevant concepts. So we have things like data centers, of course. Um, pod is another construct that we use. So when you're targeting, some workflows can target a pod, but if you want to actually target an individual node, an individual host, you can actually go through data center, um, pod, and then get the relevant list of hosts there to narrow your targets. Um, some, of, some of what we've done here is we have some custom naming. So the Kingpin UI will pick up, you can't read it here, but that says data center, and uh, that says, um, well, I can't read it here either. I think that said, oh, that's a super pod. So, the idea being, the Kingpin UI knows how to reach out to our inventory system. So when it says this workflow requires a object data center, it makes the right call out to the inventory system and puts the relevant list of data centers. Based on your selection there, it subsequently says, oh, super pods. So it filters this selection based on that selection. And so that's just some of the keywords we've built in there to make it so again, when our operators go in, they're seeing data that's relevant to um, you know, what they're trying to do in a language that they're familiar with. Uh, what I said before about how, where do the resources come from, we actually expose a um, API endpoint on Kingpin. So when Rundeck dynamically says, what are my available nodes, Kingpin is invoking the Rundeck API, which is checking the nodes against the Kingpin exposed API. So right now, that's just a really convenient way for us to sort of tie into our inventory data with the, you know, keeping the loop just between Kingpin and Rundeck. Um, it gives us a lot of options going forward. If, you know, if you want to target 100,000 nodes, we don't want to be blasting 100,000 nodes back to Rundeck to validate. We can actually know what it's calling back on and filter that list and do caching all sorts of other things. Uh, so, the security. Um, so of course, you know, we already have a data center full of operators and release engineers. Uh, we already have security models in place that we need to build on top of. So one of the things is both Rundeck and Salt expose, um, they can use an LDAP plugin for authentication and authorization. So what we set up here is Kerberos has been, in our data centers, that's how our operators auth authenticate. Um, so Kingpin has a plugin into Kerberos, so the <coughs> operator logs into Kingpin, he authenticates directly with Kerberos, we identify who he is, and then in doing so we create a dynamic and ephemeral set of credentials in LDAP. So we basically generate a user on the fly. So while you're logged into Kingpin, you get a set of users. Then we use those set of credentials to actually off into, into Rundeck. So, and, and again, that connection is really through the API, right? You know, the users don't ever see it. But that way, when Rundeck is checking against, is this a valid user, it's checking against a set of credentials that were dynamically um, generated basically for that session. So they're very ephemeral, they disappear, go away. So we have a really nice you know, way to convey down through Rundeck and Salt Stack dynamic users. We don't have to provision. We provision in Kerberos, it gets provisioned in Rundeck. Um, 
then additionally salt has its own set of um, its own set of considerations. I mean, the great thing about the Rundeck API is once you've off to it, you've got your token for you know however you have your configured time schedule. Um, of course, there's a lot of things that are going on in salt that may need to authorize back depending on what the workflow is. So those credentials can be more long lived. And so Kingpin itself actually monitors Rundeck to say, you know, when a user logs off, it removes the credentials. Um, it monitors how long runs are going to make sure that the credentials are available to salt. So if at sort of step seven it needs to reauthorize, those are still valid credentials at that time. Um, so this is the security model. Um, so open issues. There's a whole there's a whole bunch of them that we've sort of identified and we have, not that we don't have any thinking around, but that we still feel we need to be solving, which is HA, DR, and recovery. You know, right now we have really great answer for Rundex in the data center. We've got a lot of proof of concepts of things working. If that data center were to go away, how do we very, you know, transparently switch over? I mean, especially the more we pile into Gigantor, the more we're putting on top of Rundex, you know, we, we even, and especially the more we automate it, you know, it can't just be a someone gets a text and we do a VIP switch, right? Even that is probably too slow. But we also have to make sure that, you know, the job you just kicked off is very immediately transferred over into a store system that's available in another data center or another area. Um, streaming progress output. So the way we have Salt Step working right now is we get streaming output from Rundeck step by step in the workflow. But once we call out to Salt, it it kind of ends there. We know that Salt is executing, but we're not getting the log output of any operations that it executes. Um, dashboard. So one of the things that's interesting is, uh, you know, I think you pointed out in your talk that it's not just the operators that want to know what's going on. I mean, obviously, releases all the developers want to know, and this isn't just this may not even be developers that are writing the workflows themselves, but it's actually um, you know. Everyone throughout the comedy, especially like we have a whole release manager process. How do we how do we keep the security of the operators being within the data center and secured, but then exposing it in a meaningful way, especially across a large number of nodes? Um, so that's one thing we're thinking on. Uh, workflow contribution is another one. We do want to be able to empower everyone throughout. You know, we're building a platform. That's the sense. So we want to empower everyone throughout the organization to build on top of that platform. But at the same time, we don't want to make it um, insecure or or uncertain as they're doing it. We don't want, you know, we don't want to make it without testing and verification to be able to get in production and have an operator say, "Oh, great, here's this new workflow. Let me hit that right now." When it wasn't vetted through, you know, what might have worked in your test environment may not actually be safe for production. It needs to be vetted. And how do we do that in a sort of a large organization? You know, even not just through different products, but we do acquisitions, so there's all different business units and things that you know, may not have full understanding of how they operate within our data center. Uh, breakpointing came up as one. Um, you know, when we have a workflow that's well-defined, but there's an intermediate step that requires um, going out to another system that may not have an API endpoint or just some form of human interaction, um, how do we do that? Uh, workflow workflow comp uh, composition is doing partial failure rollback. You know, I think we'd love to hear more thoughts from you guys on if I run a workflow and something fails in the middle, I can rerun the workflow, but that requires, of course, that the workflow pays attention to I set up three of my seven steps. Well, you know, do your workflows end up with a ton of check code? Is that the right way to do it? Or is there, um, you know, is there a better sort of pattern to leverage here? Uh, reusable workflow components, um, I think you touched on this as well. You know, we're gonna have, you know, I think what are we targeting? Thousands of workflows. Um, how do we allow people to build on increasing complexity of workflows and leveraging the, I wanna do some, you know, maybe it's interfacing with a load balancer or checking, um, you know, the status on a, on a metric. And that might be a very simple workflow that you can execute. And then of course you can compose these into more and more complex ones. And so 
what's the right way to encode those in run deck? I mean, one of the things I think we were unsure about is, you know, what's the right way to sort of bubble up options? If you have a workflow that has two options and then it's composed into a workflow that has its own option and as it goes up the chain, how do you do that intelligently with naming? How do you know that the value that's specified here actually flows through as the same value in all these downstream workflows? Um, and then uh, solution for asynchronous callbacks for salt operations is, um, you know, if we do really want to run something across 100,000 nodes, right now we're doing polling of the salt, you know, of, of what's going on in the salt master. So how do we, is that the right pattern? How does that scale? Or is there a way that we can actually sort of throw something out into a queue and then have Rundeck take it back in a queue? And again, like I said, many of these things we have thoughts on, some of them the answers might be fairly apparent, but these are just kind of where our headspace is. Um, so. I forgot my thank you slide, but that was uh, that was pretty much what it is. Does anyone have any questions about these points or any of the earlier stuff? Awesome. <laughs> so the HRDR recovery, uh, we're working with a, a very large mega Wall uh, Street bank on that, and um, they have actually set up a four node Tomcat cluster in four data centers and they're running it hot, hot everywhere. And they, they don't, what they've done is they've got Oracle Rack uh, on the back end of it and they wrote some custom Tomcat session sharing on the run deck side. They haven't contributed back to us yet, but um, they have it working. So, and they're a global company. They, they, they won't let us say who they are in public, maybe, maybe in private. In any case, um, so it looks like a viable uh, solution, and, and we want to basically make that part of uh, an offering of some kind. We want to get the get the, uh, the implementation of it. So that that's encouraging. Um, they they had a uh, sort of a before that they had a kind of a poor man's well I wouldn't say poor, but it, they had an HA solution which was bit based, and uh, I think for the reason you said they can't. They can't communicate anything. It has to be any site, any place. As, yeah, as a good place to uh, to run it. So they, they came to that same decision. Uh, so that's one thing on that. Um, the other thing was, uh, I know what you mean by trickling down the the options down to the various layers because um, I've been building more plugins for <coughs> it for various you know uh, customer cases and just experimental cases, and I've found the same thing. Plugins are, are so much like jobs that they almost, I don't know yet, from a design standpoint, there's, there's some abstraction above that. And I'm finding the mapping, like what I call it up here makes sense at the end user, yeah, but there's an input that this plugin needs that made sense for the plugin's perspective, but how do you map these things down, especially across um, you know, steps and, and layers of the workflow? So I've gotten into that problem now. Um, the other thing was I, I was noticing in one of your screenshots you had uh, with the credentials. Uh, this guy? Previous one? Uh, next, this one, yeah. This that, one. That, that one there. I noticed it had like, uh, was it one before this? Like, oh yeah, with the salt. Yeah, okay, like yeah. Salt, API, EOF, all that stuff. The person, who, the end user doesn't need to, I mean the, the person that writes a job wouldn't necessarily need to know those things, right? I mean, the person that, that's managing the salt layer knows that, but the guy who writes the job doesn't necessarily need to know that, right? Yes, that's, Do? no, no, you're right. They, yeah. they, they are not gonna need to know that. I mean, so, so this, is a, this is a place where I found plugins to be pretty useful because you can hide a lot of the, that kind of configuration data in the run that configuration. And, uh, and so basically you can hide all that stuff you can push all that kind of configuration stuff into the run that config, and instead of having a job, this could be a place where maybe a plugin makes sense. So the plugin would look in the run that configuration and get that info, and only present whatever options the, the guy who writes the job would need. Okay, um, I'm not the guy who wrote this, so this, you might even this, say this like, is the plugin actually. So this yeah. is the salt step plugin. So um, we can certainly abstract that out. Okay. Um, I, I think if, if that's if that's an option we can do in, in the plugin, um, 
development. So we can definitely talk to the developer who put this okay. together to see if we can <coughs> strip that out and you know pull that into the configuration. I mean, for sure, you know, at some level, whoever's actually writing the input workflow, the job, there, there's no way they they wouldn't even know these things. Yeah. Right. Number one, we, you know, I already pointed out that two of them are dynamic, and the other two you would have no way of knowing as a workflow author, nor should you. Yeah. Um, it, one of the things we've been kicking around is, you know, do we need a DSL for actually composing these jobs? Right. We've worked on some custom um, user interface to to create the jobs as well. You know, we've definitely done a bunch of stuff with the Rundeck UI, but. I think we're kind of kicking around if, you know, are there even some higher level concepts that could effectively compile into the underlying yeah. workflow? Yeah, I feel the same way. It kind of gets proposed. It's, it feels like a lot of boilerplate. So yeah, some, some programmatic way to do that. Which is also nice because as, as you add new features, you can go back and change your compiler. Yeah. <laughs> and the DSL still lives. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Any other ones you've already solved that you can tell us about? Um, this was our number one excitement, is that we were going to come here and you were going to say, these aren't problems, what are you talking about? <laughs> so that's what we were looking for. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the workflow, the workflow contribution in the library and the plugins, I've been getting deeper and deeper into plugins, that's why I guess I keep talking about it. Uh, I, I think that that's a new avenue for creating the reusable tasks. And I've been looking at uh, other job, like I call them old job automation systems, where all these tasks were, like, there's a huge library of them, there's canvases you can drag all this stuff out on. And they were all single step items. And um, which, which is nice for uh, the guy who writes the job because they're just looking for functionality. And, and I think that there's two levels of how you define the functionality. One is a process, but you know the other part are these little point tasks like you know, um, bring up this uh, VM or check you know, ping it, or, I mean, the, the granularity of them is, you know, is whatever you can imagine. So you have this, you know, kind of lower level uh, libraries, and, and the plugin system, I think, fits in that layer. And then there's the process reuse, which, uh, you know, we call a job or a workflow. And I think that's sort of a solution type of reuse. And that's, that's where our thinking is on the, the job libraries. And talking to other users, it sounds, I mean, feels like we're, there's a convergence in, in that kind of layer, or thinking about that kind of layer. Um, in, in the, uh, I think it's 154 or 16, no, I think it was 153, we uh, added the, um, the air handler. Have you guys just started mm -hmm. to use the air handler? So I've been starting to use the air handler more too, and, um, and I'm, I, don't, I, I was hoping to have a demo of it today uh, for rollback. Because I've been using it in sort of a simpler sense. So like, try to do something, a single step in a job, and when it fails, the air handler tries to really do it or bail out. But I want to, actually the demo I want to do is a rollback of a botched deployment. So you start the deployment, and something goes wrong, and then the higher level rollback rolls everything back to the last metric state. So, um, I think there, there's a primitive there, but I don't think there's there's like uh, good examples, and maybe there's some gaps still to do that well. Well, we we're, were just joking about that today. You know what happens when your rollback fails? <laughs> when, you roll back, <laughs> when your rollback fails, fails. Right. Oh, yeah. right? You know, there, there's you know, it's That's turtles true. all the way down, right? <laughs> like once things start, remove that step one, remove access, step yeah. two, restore access. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's where you're going to need the breakpoint too. I mean, in some cases, you might say I could possibly do a theoretical rollback. But I should yeah. probably ask somebody if I be, you know, before yeah, I Yeah, the run home to mama button for yeah. sure. That's a good one. Yeah, I've, been, I've been playing with the, um, the error handling. we got a little bit of conditional logic in there. And it's nice in that you can pretty much, I mean, you can do basic logic with it. But there's sometimes where just aesthetically it's painful seeing that error message show up in the logs when you're actually handling what isn't an error state, it's just a decision state. Yeah. I think we should we should fix that. But I know exactly. I mean, I, I used to have this uh, this pattern. I call it assert pattern. So assert the condition I want, and uh, so the condition could be it's running. Assert running, and then I'd have like an error handler that would, if it's not running, try to do it. Right. And that that's a pretty cool little pattern. But it's not cool if assert, you know, the assert 
doesn't pass the condition that it's running, and the end user goes, "Oh my God, there's something wrong." Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm just this is the way I right. this is my logic. That's here. exactly it. Yeah. yeah. So I think we should just set. That I mean, would it be as easy as just having a, like a, a box that says this is not like not a, not an error? Right. Like or don't alert as error. Like mm -hmm. give, give it a make it a notice. Or thing. just call it conditional and have a button to say handle this as an error. Yeah. So I, I'm curious about the. Uh, you know, visualizing the output or getting the output from Salt and other tools. Uh, we, we talked to someone recently that was a heavy chef user, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, I got my automation in hand, but having that visualization layer to show people what's going on uh, under the covers was something that you know he wanted out of, out of Rundeck. Didn't really know exactly how he wanted it, but just that was a, that was a you know where he wanted it to go. So whatever you guys, your thoughts are, especially you know related to the work you've already done with Salt." Um, so where we're at right now, I mean, I think for us, that w my comment here was more around the, you know, did this, not so much did this step fail, but, you know, just how's my deployment going, right? So, right. so much higher level things. Because I think there's the other level of abstraction, of course, which is, you know, the guy who clicked the button, he wants to see every single step, and when it fails, he needs to be able to go, you know, um, investigate what's going on. Right now, where we're at is, you know, we're pretty well taking the output straight out of run deck and representing it you know, just in our own UI. Um, it is too verbose right now. I mean, even in our sort of trivial proof of concept demos, it's like, all right, this is, this is a little bit too much. I'm not sure what it was. I mean, some of the demo you showed where you know, each step was, um, you know, had a title and you could flip back between you know, the execution and the definition. I thought that, was, that, that looked pretty good, right? It looked very intuitive. And I assumed that there was a way you could drill down into a single node. So you could just like watch that node. It's on step three. It's on step four. That, and call that a baby step, because we actually got some good sponsor development on um, simplifying the whole view. The, 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 this is um, a user that their end users aren't really technical either. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't know what any of those messages mean. And they just want to know, did it work or not? They don't even, I mean, they don't even want to know very low level of what worked or not either. They want kind of a very rolled up view of the right job. Green, yeah. There's like these rough steps, and it's like spinning, check, next step. Spinning, check. I mean, that's all they want, yeah. and they want to be able to drill down from there. So that's that's really what's going to happen next. And that was just sort of a step in that direction, but that's what the think the non-techy end user one. So we'll have different views of it, but that's that's a, a key view that uh, this, this business user. I mean, another rule that I thought would be useful is, you know, if you're doing, obviously, once you get to a single node, I think it's really clear, right? You just, you kind of want to see that, you know, green, 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 red, and then drill down. But if I have like 100 or 200 nodes, red, green isn't really enough because if, if they're all failing on step six, I care that one thing, but if they're, they're failing in various ways, what's a good presentation for that? I, yeah. Just a thought we've had, I don't know that we have No, it's good. Uh, we took a couple of passes in the mockups on, on one of those cases of uh, what logical step across all the nodes that they all seem to fail on or some fail on. Yeah, so I know what you mean by kind of aggregating the result. Right. Yeah. I mean, what was the, like, just to show the difference? So if you've got you know 500 nodes, just show me the things that went different. Yeah, yeah just show me the outliers. Don't show me you know all the ones that were the same. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really good. One. Yeah. So maybe it's kind of obvious that this is I think where we really want to push the future. Well, at least the next kind of major development of Rundeck is is how do you handle these output screens? Because this is all about self-service. Like, you know, how do we make the automators look awesome? Is they can turn around their boss and other people and give them like cool shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's really where we want to we want to push it. So, any recommendations or ideas or contributions or you know whatever. We're Perfect. Yeah. I mean, always. I think that's that's really where we're at. Is, is you know, we have a lot of attention during releases. I mean, I loved your canary line. The deployment problem is really just a canary for yeah. everything before it. Um, you know, I think the place where we win is when we say. Don't ask me. Go to this dashboard, and then they talk, then they say, "Did you see the dashboard?" Right? That's really yeah. where I think well, we get to. That's. I mean, I, I just we did a case study thing with, uh, with colleagues over at Data.com, and that was Prakash's big thing was like that they you know they were doing the deployments, and something would go wrong, and everybody would have to like, you know, hey, you know, throw them some link to something in Splunk or try to and they don't really see what was happening where it's failed. So it was a major point of contention, 
and you know all kinds of bad things would 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 come out of that. So his biggest, he's like, hey, I can automate this stuff, you know, in any way. But his, his biggest point of using Rundeck was giving everybody one screen to watch, so they could see what exactly was going on. So if something failed, everybody knew 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 you know what it was. So it was 100% of visibility. He was one of the guys who really turned our thinking around about this. That you know, the automation part is a solved problem. You know, there's a million ways to do it. It's the visibility part that he didn't have an answer for. We should talk to him too. Yeah, <laughs> he did the same badge and everything. <laughs> you gotta sneak up on him and get to his building. Yeah. I can tell you from a, a visualization point of view, what I at least what we're hearing lately from our release managers is like, what 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 I boil it down to is they would love to see a progress bar with like an ETA of like yeah, it's like the Microsoft uh, yeah. installer <laughs> exactly. Right? Oh yeah. yes, we've all spent it just sits at ninety nine percent for ninety nine percent of the time. Right? Your, your grandkids will be still trying to figure out how to make a progress yeah. bar that works. Yeah. Well, actually, I noticed you had a progress bar. Yeah. Right. And uh, well, what trickery did you? Do? Well, <laughs> so what we do is uh, we we record every execution time. Right. Statistically. And statistically, yeah. so it's just a rough average. But the more you do it, you know, maybe statistically it gets closer. Actually, then it becomes interesting, too. I, I would love to know on the sort of, the 20-minute operation, that, you know, at minute 23 or whatever, is like, whoa, you're statistically out of spec here. That's pretty cool. Well, we have this uh, this program we call Show Us Your Run Day. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and this is kind of the way we can talk to the users. And this comes up, they're like, yeah, okay, so it's great. On average, it's hitting it, but they want a, like a, almost like an SPC chart. They want to be like, this is the mean, this is the, you know, the max, the min, and they want to know like deviation-wise for a job. Because people are adding steps, or they're changing the implementation of the step, or they add more nodes, or who knows what's going on, and they want to know, you know, How is the okay? stability of the process predictable anymore? <laughs> or I feel like that that's like a hard, like when I think about all the dynamic configurations if you're applying a job against you know different sets of nodes or half the nodes or whatever like how do you how do you how do you even store that right. data and present it you know your averages you know could be all over the place I think they just want to know when it's like kind of just a signal oh you know it was kind of steady and now it's not yeah it's deviation mm -hmm. just just to know that much was like important for them yeah, it's already a nice tool I, you know, I when I first created like one general purpose job that I'd hand a lot of parameters into but then I decided that I really liked seeing the progress bar be vaguely accurate, so I broke them up into separate jobs. Because uh, yeah, yeah, like half the jobs would take a huge amount of time, right. so it would be short. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. I don't know. I'm, I'm a test now. But this is the same thing with testing. So if I've got a, a function or whatever, and it's fat, it's monolithic, and I test it's like, well, what the hell is going on here? I just, just, <laughs> I'm testing x step. What's going on in x step? So that makes me break it down, break the method or function down into smaller stuff. Like, ah, that's the part that really sucks, or that's the part that's always variable. So I think uh, I think getting visibility into the variation, you know, is partly breaking it down, right? But uh, it's just being able to see it spiking up and down, and whether it's steady, that's that's the key part all the time. I almost got started on testing. Hold <laughs> <laughs> yourself in. One more beer. Well, shall we uh, call it a night here? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for. Thanks, Alex. Uh,